Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to class. Hope you all had a good weekend, good time at church, good time with family and friends over the weekend, and uh, ready for another week. OK? Uh, we'll begin looking at Romans chapter 2. We'll study Romans chapter 2 today. And before that, uh, we'll just pause for a word of prayer. Uh, can I ask one of you to please lead us in prayer, please, anyone? John, Paul, or Anita, anyone can lead us in prayer? Okay, let's, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for this morning. Thank you for bringing us together in your presence. We pray, Lord, that you would speak to us, help us to understand your word. We submit pastor into your hands, and we pray that she'd be able to uh, reveal the mysteries of your word to us. God, Holy Spirit, lead us and guide us. Teach us, Lord Jesus, so that we would be able to understand the truths of your scripture, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John Paul. Uh, we'll begin Romans chapter 2, so we can read through Romans uh, chapter 2. And uh, can somebody, you know, read maybe the first, um, there are around 29 uh, verses. So maybe, you know, all of you can read about... Um, five or six verses can somebody start reading verses one to five or verse six and then we can move on please romans chapter two verses one to five one to six therefore you are inexcusable O man whoever you are you who judge for in whatever you judge another you condemn yourself for you who judge practice the same things but we know the judgment of god is according to truth against those who practice such things and do you think this O man you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same that you will escape the judgment of God or do you despise the riches of his goodness forbearance and long suffering not knowing that goodness of God leads you to repentance but in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each one according to his deeds Thank you, Jeffina. Thank you, Jeffina. So can someone else read verses uh, 7 to maybe uh, 14 or 15? Can someone else read verses 7 to verse 14 or verse 15, please? Okay, uh, was Verse anyone three. wants to read? Okay, so read Zillow to me. Thank you. Okay. Eternal, eternal life to those who by patient continence in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortal immortality. Proceed. But to those who are self seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. 19. Oh, uh, sorry, 9. Tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also of the Greek. Then, but glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works the, what is good to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 11. For there is no partiality with God. 12. For as many as have, have sinned without law will also perish without law. 
and as many as have seen in the law will be judged by the law 13 for not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of god but the doers of the law will be justified 14 for when gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law this although not having the law are a law to themselves 15 who who show the work of the law written in their hearts their conscience also bearing witness and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them Oh, was 16 as well, Zelotoli? Just was 16, please. Okay, 16. In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Amen. Thank you. So even as we read verses uh, 1 to verse 16, is there anything that, you know, uh, any thought that has come to your mind, any verse, uh, any phrase, any word that just leapt out at you from scripture? Anything that you remember studying before, hearing before, or God has spoken to you through any of these verses, anyone would like to share some thoughts? Chapter 2, verses 1 to 16. Or anything that just stood out for you even as we were reading it? Maybe the Holy Spirit just prompted something, something just came to your mind. Anyone would like to share? Romans chapter 2, verse 1 to 16. Um. Sorry, Jeffina, you're saying? Okay, Jeffina saying she's just excited to uh, learn. Um, the you know uh, the interpretation or the meaning or the revelation from these verses okay thank you yes Salatoli. um verse 11 stood out the most for me like it says for there is no partiality with god like uh in the past where uh, when i was 13 in ministry i happened to work under some leaders who you know show very partiality i can see but you know, as I'm going through the scriptures, it just stood out and reminded me no matter what, uh, you know, um, I just need to make my heart right, my attitude right. And you know, I'm not serving the leader, I'm serving the Lord. And this really helped me in working along uh, with that uh, leader. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much for sharing that. I think that's so true. There is no partiality with God. Sometimes, even in family, parents with their children you know there is partiality we see that schools that we study and teachers the way we treated us of friends there's partiality among siblings there's partiality even in the workplace and sometimes we get very frustrated we can get very dejected uh, we can feel uh, down let down uh, but it's so wonderful to know that it, with god there is no partiality yes he loves us all the same he looks at us all the same, and uh, that's so wonderful. Thank you, Zelotoli, for sharing that. Anyone else would like to share anything that uh, stood out for you? Anything you were reminded that you studied before? Any scripture passage from this uh, verses that we looked at? Romans chapter 2, verses 1 to 16. Hello, ma. Yes, yes, Abu Bakr. Please go ahead. Romans chapter 2, verse 5. It says, But after thy hardness and repentance, in the impenitence, ask the treasure is open to thyself. Write a great piece of wrath and the revision of the righteousness judgment of God. So this place is telling us that a soft and a repentant act is needed to avoid God right, God wrath on the days of wrath, on the days of judgment, the final judgment. Trust the and leads someone to trust Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins. But most of uh, but unfortunately most people storing up wrath for themselves on the final day. So that uh, that is very 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 is something that is going on around the world now. People don't care about the idea of judgment anymore. 
and because of this, uh, we, uh, the wrath of God is, is upon many people, and the only solution for that is a soft and a repentant act, so that we can avoid the day of wrath of judgment. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Yes, so important. You know, we harden our hearts. Uh, some of us, even, you know, even if we are pastors or preachers or teachers or in the ministry or, you know, just basically receive salvation, children of God, we can harden some of the areas of our heart where we treasure up, you know, uh, sin and, uh, you know, ultimately the wrath of God. And yes, you know, God is a gracious, compassionate, merciful and forgiving God, but he's also a God who is a righteous God who will come as the judge. And yes, we will have to, um, you know, give an account for our lives. Yes, thank you for pointing that out. And, you know, people of this world also just treasure up wrath for themselves, failing to know that there is a judgment that is coming, awaiting them. Thank you. Anyone else would like to share? Okay. There are no more uh, thoughts, or you, and no one else wants to share. We'll we look at st or study chapter two. Now, in chapter two, Paul is dealing with the issue of uh, law and conscience, uh, both with the Jews and uh, Gentiles, and Paul is basically, you know, debating within himself, uh, thinking in terms of what the uh, the, the you know his readers or those who are going to read his letter you know thinking according to their mindset or what they would be thinking in their minds and according to what they are thinking in their minds or what they would uh, you know what their thoughts would be he's he's thinking and he's addressing that or he's basically uh, writing it so he's basically debating within himself with the mind of the uh, readers and this whole issue of uh, law and conscience uh, with respect to the Jews and the uh, Gentiles. So he's saying for the Jews they have the law and the Gentiles they don't have the law. So how is God going to judge the Gentiles? Okay. Yes, of course the Jews they have the law, so they're going to be judged by the law or according to the law. And how are the Gentiles going to be judged? So Paul says there is a law, an inbuilt law that is in every person. And what is this inbuilt law that is in every person? There are two things. Uh, one is reason and the other is conscience. So there is reason and there is conscience, which means that within every person, the way God has designed us, he's already given us these two things. What are these two things? You know, these two things is uh, the uh, reason and conscience. And this reason and this conscience actually tells us about God. It tells us what is right and wrong. And that is what he is talking, spoken about in chapter 1. He says, hey, if you look at creation, creation reveals the eternal power the 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 godhead it uh, reveals the uh, uh, the uh, you know the nature of god uh, okay uh, sorry lubega i think uh, you got the link only now at 742 okay uh yeah, I will um, basically I just finish another class. I have first two hours. So uh, by the time I move from that classroom to this classroom and set things up, so uh, the link goes in, goes out late, but I'll ensure that uh, I post the link um, right on time um, from next week onward. Sorry for the inconvenience. And um, yeah, so what we were basically doing is so far was you, you didn't miss anything much. We were just reading. Uh, we read uh, Romans chapter 2 verses 1 uh, to verse 16 and I just asked a couple of them uh, to share. Um, so three of them shared. Um, uh, Jeffina said that she's looking forward to learning from Romans chapter 2. Then we have Zelutoli who talked about um, Romans chapter 2 verse um, 
um, was I think it was was um, um, six where God says uh, you know there is no partiality with God was eleven, and then Abu Bakr he shared also from Romans chapter uh, four where you know people um, sorry verse five where he talks about people hardening their hearts and storing up for themselves wrath. Uh, when they are going to face a judgment from God. And then I just began, uh, Lubega, you know, giving a background to Romans chapter 2. Okay, he's left the meeting again. Okay. So he'll, I think maybe he's lost his connection. Okay. So um, in chapter 2, as I said, that Paul is dealing with the issue of law and conscience, both with regards to Jews and Gentiles. So Paul says that inside all of us, there is an inbuilt, um, you know, um, law that is there in every, in every person. And these two things is reason and conscience. That means within every person, the way God has designed us, he's already given us uh, these two things. Uh, reason and he's given us conscience. So reason is, you know, what he was talking about in the latter part of chapter one, where he says, hey, you know, nobody can say that uh, they do not know there is a God, uh, uh, you know, or they can't say that there is no God, show to me God, or prove to me that the existence of God is creation itself you know, proves the, um, uh, the, the eternal power, uh, the eternal nature. It reveals the Godhead. Um, and so people are without any excuse. So by reason, reasoning of their mind, they can know that, you know, this inbuilt thing that God has designed, they know that there is a God, that is there is the existence of our God, and it's not things or man or animals that is God, but there is a God who created all of this. And then, you know, so reason actually tells us about God, it reveals God to us, which is an inbuilt thing that God has given to us. And then there is conscience. Conscience basically helps us to know what is right and wrong. Okay, so there's reason and conscience. So those who do not have the law, Paul is saying, you know, uh, they have the reason and conscience to know about God, to know about what is good and bad. So they are not left without any excuse. So the Jews have no excuse because they have the law. They will be judged by the law. The Gentiles say, hey, we, we don't know what is right and wrong because God has not given us the law. But Paul is saying, hey, you can't say that because you know, there's something that's inbuilt the way God has designed as he's given us a conscience. And a conscience tells us what is right and um, wrong. Okay. And then Paul very interestingly says, you know, but everyone will not, will be judged by the, how will everyone be judged by? What does he say in Romans chapter two? He says, everyone will be judged according to the gospel whether it is Jew or Greek, you know, verse 16, he says, in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. So Paul is saying the Jews will not just be judged by the law. The Gentiles will not be judged by their conscience, the inbuilt um, uh, way God has designed them of reason and conscience. But um, Paul says that everyone will be judged according to the uh, according to the uh, gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, whether you are a Jew or a Gentile. So then he we we'll just begin looking at uh, 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 Romans chapter two verse one. Okay, so. Uh, we see that, you know, uh, Paul in chapter one says man is sinful. He has suppressed the truth. He has gone after his own wild passions and thoughts of his corrupt mind. And therefore, man, you are inexcusable. Uh, and he says that, you know, even if you ju are judging somebody, you are in, uh, uh, you're not excused, you're inexcusable. And he's speaking to the Jews and he's saying, if you are a teacher of the law and you don't keep the law, it's pointless. And 
you know, because God is going to judge you by the law. He's going to judge you by what you are teaching. So it's it's pointless, you know, you are just holding on to the law. You're saying, hey, you know, we are these great people. We have the law. We have the prophets. We have the covenants. And you're looking down on the uh, Gentiles. But what is the point? You know, you are teachers of the law. You are the custodians of the law. The law is given to you. And you don't keep the law. Then it's basically pointless. And God is going to judge all of us. Okay. And uh, Paul is saying, hey, Jews, we can point to the Gentiles saying that, hey, you're doing all of these things, um, uh, you know, and, which is not right. And he's saying, but we too are inexcusable because we judge others. Uh, and, you know, when we judge others, we will be judged by the same standard. So he's basically saying, you know, don't judge others, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, you know, you don't judge others. But he's basically talking from the point of view from of the Jews and he's including himself because he's a Jew and he's speaking to the Jews and he says, if you are a teacher of the law and you don't keep it, it's pointless because going God is going to judge us. And he says, you know, um, we can point to the Gentiles and say, hey, you're not doing all of these things. But at the same time, we are as Jews inexcusable because when we judge others, we too will be judged by the same standards. Okay? Verse 3, he says, and do you think this, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Okay. So verse 3 is saying, you are doing the same thing and when you do the same thing and you expect others to do what you are not doing then you cannot ex uh, escape the judgment of god everyone you know whether they are jew or greek paul says we are all going to be judged by the life that we are living the kind of life that we are living and then he says there is no partiality with god you know but he says, those who would be judged are whom? Who would be judged first? The Jew first and then the Greek. He mentions this uh, twice. He says this in verse 9 and verse 10. He says, you know, the Jew first and then the Greek. So he says, we are all going to be judged. So we can't point our fingers at others, you know, for whatever point uh, or whatever place we are judging others, we are doing it ourselves and we are going to be judged by the same standards. Verse 4, he says, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Okay, so in verse 4, he says, Don't despise the goodness, the patience, and the long suffering of God. Why? Why is he asking us not to despise the goodness, the patience, and the long suffering of God? Why is he asking us in uh, verse 4 not to despise the richness of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering? Thank you, Jeffina, because he says it's, you know, because the goodness of God leads to what? It leads you to repentance. Now think about this. The goodness of God leads you to repentance. What does Paul really mean by saying that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Any thoughts? Okay, we know that God is a just God, and He is a God who demands justice, okay, for sin. He's also a righteous God, which means that, you know, He demands that there is a judgment for sin. Every sin, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, when we sin, God is just, He's righteous, He has to punish sin, okay? But how does God deal with sinful man. Paul is saying, yes, you know, at one hand, God is just and he's righteous. When he sees sin, he has to judge sin. He has to pass the judgment. At the same time, we know that God is good. 
He is gracious, he is compassionate, he is merciful, forbearing, loving. So it's like, you know, um, uh, the weighing balance, okay? Two sides. God is just and also God is loving and forgiving and merciful and uh, compassionate. So how does God deal with sinful man when we say, hey, he's just in punishing sin, but also he is good and gracious and compassionate and uh, merciful, Paul says the goodness of God leads people to repentance. Yes, God will judge sin, but what is really God doing when he judges sin? He's drawing people by his goodness, his mercy, his forbearance, and his long-suffering. Okay, So when God judges sin, he passes out the judgment, which means we face the consequences for our sin, right? We do face the consequences for our sin. Uh, sin is not overlooked. It's not condoned. It's not, uh, uh, you know, hidden under the carpet, so to say. You know, God is not saying, hey, okay, I, this is the grace period. You can do what you want. I'll just cover up your sin. I will just act like I didn't look at it. No, there is consequences um, for our sin. And what these consequences of the sin that we go through is not something that God uh, uh, wants us to go through because, uh, you know, he wants us to be punished and feel terrible for our sins and feel like this worm. But we read in scripture that, you know, just like a father disciplines his son, so our heavenly father also disciplines us because he loves us. How much more a heavenly father will discipline us because he loves us. So, when an earthly father di disciplines um, his or her child, he's doing it because he loves the child. He's doing it because he doesn't want the child to go away, do things that are wrong, commit the same mistake that can be harmful, detrimental for that child. The same way our Heavenly Father punishes us so that we do not go away in the paths of sin and unrighteousness and unholiness, but we walk in paths of uh, uh, righteousness and holiness. So it's only when we face the consequences of our sin. Now, when we face consequences of our sin, how do we react? Sorry? Yeah, when we go through, um, you know, uh, suffering, when we go through uh, pain, what do we basically do? We realize what sin we have committed, right? We said, hey, I've done this and that is why I've done this sin. Or even if we have not done, I mean, we, nothing comes to mind. We're saying, God, uh, you know, I'm going through this hard struggle, this period in my life where I'm just seeing dead ends, hindrances, mountains, giants I'm facing. You know, what sin did I commit? God, show me what sin I commit. I will, you know, I would uh, uh, seek your uh, forgiveness. I will, I will repent, God, so that I can do away with all of this difficult phase of life that I am so they can receive your mercy and, and grace and your favor and your goodness. So actually, when we go through difficulties, we are thinking about our sinful habits, sinful ways and how we can repent and we come back, you know, uh, to God. So, you know, so Paul is basically saying that God will judge sin, but God is really trying to do this even as he judges sin or when we face the consequences of sin, he's drawing people to himself by his goodness, mercy, forbearance, and long-suffering. And people realize that, hey, you know, when I was doing obedient to God, doing what he wanted, I enjoyed his favor, enjoyed his goodness, enjoyed his blessing. Now I've stepped away, and know, you know what happens when you step away from your spiritual covering, right? You step away from the spiritual covering, you you encounter whom? Satan. And Satan is all out to steal, kill, and destroy our um, life. And this is what we will also study the next semester when you when you study Paul writing to Timothy. He says, you know, there is this man who is, you know, committing this grievous sin, you know, correct him, and he's you, you've corrected him, but he's not changed. So I want you to throw him out of the fellowship. So we can think, hey, you know, how rude of Paul to say, throw him out of the fellowship, have nothing to do with him. Uh, and But Paul says, you know, by doing so, he can, you know, you will you will save his soul. So how, what, what does Paul mean? Even when Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, he says, um, you know, give that person up to Satan. You know, and when you read that, you can say how rude of Paul to say, give that person up to uh, Satan. But what Paul is 
basically trying to say is, you know, when this person is out of the fellowship, he's basically, he or she is basically outside the spiritual covering of God. And when he or she is outside the spiritual covering of God, they're open to the attacks of the evil one who's all out to steal, kill, and destroy. And when they go through troubles and difficulties, they will recognize their sin. They would repent and they would come back. So it's actually going to work for their benefit. It's actually going to work for their uh, good. And that is why Paul says, so we see it here that, you know, God would judge sin, but God is really trying what is God trying to do, even as he uh, punishes people of their sin, is to draw people by his goodness, mercy, forbearance, and um, long suffering. So what Paul is saying is, you know, hey, when we are dealing with the issue of sin and sinfulness with people, we know what is right and wrong, but we need to know that the goodness of God leads to repentance. So don't judge people. You know, uh, it, it also doesn't mean don't overlook their sin, don't condone their sin. It does not mean don't encourage sin. No, we have to deal with sin. You know, we need to correct them. But we also need to demonstrate the goodness and the mercy of God, knowing that the goodness of God leads one to repentance. Okay. So even as you don't condone the sin, even as you don't overlook it, don't encourage sin, but even as we correct the people, deal with the sin and not the person. Don't, you know, be rude or, you know, just uh, ignore the person or, you know, do harm to that person where the person's character, this whole person's mind or, you know, his emotions is so uh, broken, the way we treat him and the way we punish him for the things that he's done, but deal with his sin in a way that demonstrates God's good, good, goodness, his mercy, his loving kindness, so that it will lead them to uh, repentance. So, um, Paul says, you know, we are all doing the wrong things. We're all going to be judged for the wrong that we do. And he says, Jews first and then the Greeks. So we can't point our fingers at others because we ourselves are doing it and we cannot judge others. But be kind, be good, be merciful to everyone. Okay. And verses 12 to 16, he talks of how everyone will be judged. And he says, the Jews have the law. The law will judge them. The Gentiles are without the law, but they too will perish without the law. And when he says they too will perish without the law, he's not talking about the law that God gave uh, to the Jews. So what what about the Gentiles, you know, who don't have the law? You know, Paul is saying in verse 14, for when Gentiles who do not have the law, um, by nature do things in the law, these all although not having the law, are law to themselves, okay? So he's telling Gentiles, by nature, they do things pertaining to the law, which means he's saying, you know, he's not talking about the law that God gave the Israelites. He's saying that the way people are designed, we are designed with something inside us. Inside of us, we all have a conscience that tells us what is right and wrong, okay? But so Paul is saying, hey, you don't have the law of the Gentiles. The law is not given to you, but you have an inbuilt law. And what is that? Something that is inside you and that is your conscience. Okay. Look at what he says in verse 15. Who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. So the law, he's saying, is written in their hearts. And what is this law that is written in the hearts of the Gentiles? He's talking about the conscience. Okay, He says their conscience tell them that this is okay, this is not okay. Their conscience tells them this is right and this is not right. So every man is born with a conscience. Or he's saying this conscience is a law written in their hearts, and it's a capacity to know the right and wrong, uh, which is an inbuilt thing in every uh, person, which God has designed all of us in that way with our conscience. And he's calling this conscience as the law for the Gentiles. Now, can the conscience be smeared or damaged? Can your conscience be smeared, damaged, or even dead? Yes or no? Can I have some answers, please? 
Yes. What about okay, Jeffina saying yes? What about our online students? Can our conscience be smeared? Uh, you know, dead, damaged? Yes, no. Yes, our conscience can be damaged. Uh, it can be smeared. It can be uh, dead. Thank you, Zelatoli. You know, um, uh, and our ability to know right and wrong can be damaged. Okay, so when we continue indulging in sin, people, uh, it's it, uh, we know that our conscience is dead to that part. So you know, we don't even have to think about lying because we're so used to lying; it becomes a habit, and our conscience is dead to lying. So we can just lie in and out. Lying becomes like a natural self, a natural part of our character or who we um, are. And he says that, you know, we need to remember that the conscience does not replay, replace the gospel. The conscience does not replace the gospel. The conscience is an alternate law, but it cannot replace the gospel. So what basically Paul is saying here is, hey, you Jews have the law, but you will, uh, you know, you can follow it. The, the, the Gentiles don't have a law, but they have an inbuilt law that is God is designed in everyone, and that is their conscience. But he finally says the Jews will not be judged by that law. The Gentiles will not be judged by the law that is their conscience, but all of us will be judged by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, so in Verse 16, he says, in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So in verse 16, he concludes that God is going to judge the secrets of men according to my gospel. So the judgment of God, which is a righteous judgment, which is not an impartial judgment, and is judgment according to the truth will be done according to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It will not be done according to the law or the conscience, but all of us, irrespective of Jews or Gentiles, will be judged according to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we can say, hey, what happens to those people who do not hear the gospel? How will they be judged? Okay. So Paul has explained so far in chapter 1 and chapter 2 that, you know, there are people who have the law and there are people who don't have the law. The Jews have the law, the Gentiles don't have the law. But he's saying that even though the Gentiles don't have the written law that God has given the Jews, there are two things in every, per in every person that is inbuilt, that God has designed them, that, you know, that uh, reason and conscience. Reason tells them, hey, there is a God, telling them to seek the true and living God. So every person has a re reason. And he says that, you know, through creation, every person can look and say, yes, there is a creator God. The invisible attributes of God are seen clearly in creation. And also every person has a conscience, whether there's Jew or Gentile, every person has a conscience and that conscience tells them what is right and wrong. So these two things in every person is basically directing us or it's convicting us and telling us, hey, there is a God that you should seek after this true and living God. And every person who seeks after this God, this true and living God, every person who's searching for this truth, Paul says, God in some way will bring that gospel of Jesus Christ to that person. Now, if a person dies without hearing the gospel, what will happen to them? True, they have the reason. True, they have their conscience. And their conscience says that there is a true and living God and you have to seek after him. But they never hear about Jesus Christ and they die. Okay, But we can state according to verse 16 that everyone will be judged according to the gospel of Jesus Christ. No excuse. So will God have any other way? that he will judge these people who have never heard about the gospel. Now, scripture does not mention that to us, so hence we cannot come up with an alternative. We cannot come up with an alternate option. All we know is what we read in verse 16, where it says that in that day God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my 
gospel. So there's no other option. So what should we do is, you know, say that, hey, conscience is not an alternative. It's not a replacement to the gospel. You know, uh, law is not an alternative. It's not a replacement for the gospel. Uh, and in verse 16, it says, people will be judged according to the gospel. So what is the gospel? What is the gospel? Those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. And without Christ, there is no salvation. There is no other name given to men by which they can be saved. So we cannot say that God will use conscience to judge the people who have not heard the gospel. This is a wrong conclusion. Um, uh, we cannot say that. We cannot say that, you know, uh, people, the Jews will be judged according to the law because they did not hear the gospel of Jesus Christ be preached to them. No. But according to verse 16, we just know that everyone will be judged according to the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no other alternative. And when people seek the true and living God, the gospel, God in some way will have the gospel preached to them. And that is why, you know, it is important for us to share and proclaim the gospel okay because everyone will be judged and no one can you know uh, uh say you know can we say hey our conscience can judge us no and that is why we need uh to proclaim that is why we need to share the gospel okay anyone has any questions so far any questions okay Jeffina has a question. Uh, yeah. So um, basically, this chapter, I'm just, I just want to know whether I'm uh, understanding in the right way. So basically, this chapter talks about the judgment of God, like uh, how people get saved, like the final judgment. I asked what is I believe. So sometimes people use this uh, in saying, uh, like, you should not judge my character. Uh, you who are you to judge? Uh, so what do you think about that? Like, we had a devotion. We are reading Romans 2 at hostel. Uh, every morning, we girls have a group devotion. So at hostel, we were reading this today. And that's why I was so excited to see this real perspective, like what really understanding was like. So basically, I've seen people use this scripture, who are you to judge me? Who are you to condemn me? Who are you to correct me? Uh, you should not judge another. Uh, how you judge me, you'll be, you'll be judged in the same way. So what do you think about people using it in the other way? Like, I mean, in judging others. I'm making sense. Yes. So how... Uh... See, uh, judging is, you know, when um, it's like, you know, judging the person and putting down the person and condemning the person. You know, Romans 8, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ uh, Jesus. That does, that, that, uh, does that mean that God is not going to condemn our sin or he's just going to overlook our sin? He's going to cover our sin? He's uh, not going to look at our sin? No. He is a righteous God. He is a just God. And he looks at sin and he punishes sin. Okay. So it doesn't mean that God covers up sin, but he does not condemn us. So uh, when we, we, when you're talking about judgment, it's judging, are you judging the sin or judging the person? You know, so we need to help the person. So that's why he says here, you know, the goodness of God leads to repentance, goodness, forbearance, mercy. So in this verse, he's saying, hey, you know, uh, he, he's basically talking in the context of Jews who are saying, you have the law and you are trying to, you know, in the early church, uh, this was a problem. The Jews were trying to bring in, uh, you know, certain kind of eating habits, food habits, uh, telling the Gentiles you have to follow these rituals, these specific days. They were bringing in endless genealogies. They were bringing in uh, the circumcision ritual. And they were saying, you know, you have to do all of these things and even you have to keep the law. And he's saying, hey, you Jews, you don't keep it yourself. And when you don't keep it, how can you judge somebody else, you know, that they are not keeping it because you are you yourself are breaking the uh, law. So he's talking about in a sense of pride, in a sense of do thinking that you're greater, you're having a place of dominion. But at the same time, Paul is saying that 
you know, God is the one who judges, but even look at when he judges sin, how does he do it? Even though he's a judge and righteous God, he does it with goodness, with mercy, with forbearance and with patience. So he's saying maybe when somebody does something wrong, it doesn't mean that we don't, we, we overlook their sin. No, we don't overlook their sin. We help them, you know, come out of their sin. But how do we do it? We do it with a sense of love, goodness, patience, you know, and forbearance. Okay, good question. Okay, any more questions? If not, we'll move on to verse uh, uh, 17. Uh, so can somebody please read verses 17 to 20 quickly, please? Anyone can read verses 17 to 20? Nobody wants to read verses 17 to 20? Romans chapter 2, verses 17 to 20. Indeed, you are called a Jew and rest on the law and make your boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are excellent being instructed out of the law and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolishness, foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and the truth in the law. 17 to Thank you, Jepina. So verse 17. Yeah, verse 17, you know, um, he's strongly rebuking the Jews. It's a strong rebuke to the Jews. He says, Hey Jews, you're resting, you're relying in the law and uh, making your boast in God. And in verse 18, he says, we know his will, and we can tell you what is, uh, you know, right and wrong. But Paul is telling them, you know what is right and wrong. They're teaching it, but you yourself are not doing it. And when you're teaching it and you yourself are not doing, you're also breaking the law. Okay. So Paul is basically building up the case here. He's telling the Jews, Jews, it's true that you have the law, you know everything in the law, but you are also breaking the law. And then in verses 19 and um, 20, he says, And are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and the truth in the law. You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles before, because of you, as it is written. So Paul is saying, hey, you have the law of Jews, you boast about it, but you are teaching it, but you yourself are not able to keep it. And because you are not able to keep it, at every point you are breaking not just one law, but you're breaking all of the laws. So you're saying don't steal, but you're stealing. You're saying don't commit adultery, but you're committing adultery. And by doing this, what are you basically doing? You're bringing blasphemy to the name of God. And for, for, the, for the Jews, you know, to blaspheme the name of God is something really big for them. That's something that they won't even want to do or dare to do. But he's equaling it by not keeping the law, breaking the law, and judging others, he's saying you're basically uh, blaspheming the name of God. Okay. Uh, we'll continue verses um, 25 to verse 29. Just a few more thoughts, and then we'll end this chapter. Any questions? Anyone else? Any ha anyone else has? Or any questions? Does anyone has any questions? Any thoughts? Anything that you didn't understand? Anything that you like to share? No? Okay, if there's uh, nothing you'd like to share or no questions, we'll end class today. Thank you, everyone, for um, joining class. Have a blessed day and a blessed week ahead. And I will see you on uh, Friday. Thank you. Thank you, Poster.
Thank you, Zenatoli.